Welcome to the Small Town Podcast, a resource for arts professionals. I'm Sarah Roach Lewis, and I'm so pleased to welcome our guest today, Louise Carota. And she's here to talk to us about stress management and um, how to how to manage the stress that we all experience. Um, Louise was raised in California as one of 19 children. Yes, you did hear that right. Her parents had six of their own and adopted 13. She was homeschooled and traveled around a lot, mostly in a school bus. What living in a large family teaches you is about the the ability to get along with others. Uh, while the, she was young, they uh, the move, their family moved to, to Canada, um, to Ottawa, and then Prince Edward Island, first for the summers and then permanently. So during her teen years, she studied painting and sculpture in Italy. Later, she moved back to Ottawa to raise her daughter. She is best known as a sculptor of cast stainless steel figures featured in the Ottawa Firefighters Memorial, which is a public mon monument right in front of City Hall. Painting and art is definitely her first love. Returning home to the island six years ago, Louise has lived a wide variety of experiences, including being a Reiki healer, a video producer, and editor. For 17 years, she did daycare out of her home in Ottawa, gaining major insights into the human psyche. Children have it right. They are genuine, live in the moment, and appreciate the little things in life. As a single mom, stress was something she experienced firsthand. If only she knew then what she knows now, which is why she is so dedicated to helping others make their road a little less arduous. Part of being homeschooled is perfecting the art of self-directed learning. For many years, Louise has delved into such diverse subjects as quantum mechanics, the workshop of the human brain, or the workings of the human brain, anthropology, history, and interpersonal relationships. Being in the zone while painting, playing sports, and giving Reiki for her is second nature. So moving deeper into meditation, which was the natural next step. Many people Louise talked to were also interested in learning how to meditate, which led to the development of a four-part series, Meditation in Your Brain. She taught this two years ago at the Spirituality Center in Charlottetown. The positive feedback from the course inspired stress release workshops that are filled with sound principles and techniques to increase emotional resilience. Her approach is simple. Rather than trying to change things beyond your control, learn to adjust your reaction. So Louise, I'm really excited to uh, dig in and talk to you today about how do we get relief from stress? What are the information and what are the techniques that you can help us with um, to, help, to help people who work in the arts community, in not-for-profits, um, manage uh, the, the stress that they feel? So let's just have, let's get started with getting a handle on stress. What is stress? Well, uh, in my research and the stuff that I've read and I guess in personal experience, stress is pretty simple. It's um, not feeling safe. So you feel hypervigilant, you're always in the fight or flight mode, and it's kind of a holdover from her, um, early human survival. And stress is also feeling outmatched by what life is throwing at you. It's either exhaustion or money issues or handling difficult people or health concern or poor working conditions, too much to do, um, not enough money, too much to do. And um, even the news and the state of the world can kind of um, contribute to our st stress level. So just it's really feeling like you're not safe, you can't relax, and there's just you just feel a bit overwhelmed by what's before you. Mm. And it's pretty common. Uh, actually, they say that um, we're in a state of uh, moderate to high levels of stress 70% of the time. So it's a common theme in our, you know, high pay society. Sure, yeah. And I think, too, you know, one of the things that I see from in the role uh, of managing an, an organization, it's very much like running a business. Yeah. And so there's always, in my experience, more to do than time in the day. And so that can lead to some of those feelings of stress and also a feeling of like, I have to get all of this done. So there's a bit of overwhelm that comes with that. And I think, uh, you know, for people who are listening, 
it is easy to dismiss this as um, perhaps not for them, not important. And I would say that one of the things, I mean, just from a sort of deep human level, we don't want to see people stressed. We don't want to be around people who are stressed. And it's not really fair that um, our, our work, by the nature of the precariousness of it, contributes to that, that stress. I also see for those folks who are maybe part of the board of directors, as an ED, sometimes we carry that with a badge of honor that we do so much. Um, and we're, when, we, when people ask us, well, how are you? I'm busy. It is that badge of honor. And I think as a board members, sometimes we think we're so lucky because we've got this ED who, or these staff members who are working so hard. And what I would say is, it's this is why this, this topic is so near and dear, I think, is because it is really important that from that board perspective, you recognize your role in ensuring your staff attempt to have some degree of self-care. That is something that I think it's really important that boards talk about and that organizations talk about, not be, not just because it's important that, um, you know, we, we want to make sure that people's mental and physical and emotional health are, are managed from that super practical perspective, the non-altruistic perspective that that is what's best for your organization as well. So um, tell me a little bit then around you know, that idea of getting along with others, um, what, what is the interaction between, you know, sort of those interpersonal relationships that we have and stress, or how do we build that community that we want to hang out in? Well, um, when you're dealing with um, kind of unwieldy people, it's challenging, and we all face, you know, uh, situations where we're with coworkers or, you know, even our families, and it's they're unwieldy. It's not that they're difficult. It's just that we can't. It's hard to manage uh, their reactions and hard to manage our reaction to them, and that's really the place where you can lower your stress level. You can't change them necessarily, but you can respond to them in a less stressful way. So it's about learning resilience and, and what I teach uh, in the Getting Comfortable With Yourself uh, workshop is about how can you maintain your equilibrium in adversity or faced with uh, people that are difficult. How can you maintain that sense of calm and allow them to say or do whatever they want without reacting or having it hurt your feelings or, you know, undermine your self-esteem. So it's a really kind of the, the two parts together is one is, um, you know, working with challenging people and then also uh, working with your own reaction to them. So it's kind of a two together. And then building a strong community is so important um, because it really is a sense of support and can reduce our stress immeasurably if we have, like, there's a bunch of studies that show how important it is to have a strong community around us. But in order to build a strong community, you have to invest in it. You have to be generous. You have to be. You have to empathize with people, and you also have to have high emotional IQ so that you're responding appropriately to what other people are are asking of you. And and then that's the that's the real you know base of community building is responding appropriately to what they're asking, not asking, not letting them ask too much of you. And, um, you know, there's a lot of talk about keeping boundaries, um, appropriate boundaries, but it's a lot about just maintaining your equilibrium and then you're confident to just say, no, I can't do that. And it's, you know, self-awareness to know um, what's important to you, uh, what your triggers are. And uh, self-awareness is something that is uh, um, a theme that runs through most of the stuff that I teach people. So if, we, if I was at the beginning of this journey, so let's just have an imagination session that, you know, we're, we're having this conversation what are some things that I can do to those little things around self-awareness? Like, what are the first steps in that? 
Well, one of the questions that I answer in the the workshops and the stuff that I teach is, what is it to know yourself? Because we've been, mm. you know, um, encouraged, know thyself. But, you know, if you stop for a second, like, what does that mean? So knowing yourself is knowing, having some detachment from the thoughts that are running through your head. So not to identify um just with the thoughts, like the thoughts that you think inside of your head are not you. There's an observer part of you that can detach a little bit and step back from those thoughts. And so a big part of self-awareness is observation of the thoughts that you're thinking. And then the other really important, and it's one of the areas that I most focus on, is what are the emotions that we are experiencing? Because we, um, certain events, uh, very challenging events, trigger really intense emotions. And um, post-traumatic stress disorder is when those intense emotions trigger old habits and then you find yourself running a program that you have no control over and you're just out of the loop. And so the such an important first step of self-awareness is um, being present for the emotions that we're experiencing. And some of them are can be very intense. So we need a practice or a process to sit down with our emotions. But first, we really need to think of it as a priority because we do a lot of things that are not helpful and not healthy. We vent to other people. We get people involved with how we feel. We get them to take sides because we're not not getting along with someone and we just we don't know what to do with this really intense emotion or the worst thing we do is we repress it and we ignore it and which leads to all kinds of health issues um, and so uh, you know, the number one thing with self-awareness, beside observation of your thoughts and detaching from your thoughts, is understanding and being present for the emotion that those thoughts trigger in you. And then having a process to, to um, sit with them and be present in a healthy uh, way. Because if those emotions are present in you, um, and you think of a past event, it's not the past event that stresses you. It's the, it's the um, emotions that are still caught in you mm -hmm. that make it difficult for you to let that past event go. Mm -hmm. And so the emotions that we feel are in the present, the thing that happened might have been in the past. So processing emotion is such a big thing. And then that, what that does is it gives you resilience. So when you're dealing in the present, even with a really stressful situation, you don't have all this baggage that you're bringing into it. You can actually just deal with the challenging situation um, as it is. And it just reduces the stress it's amazing how much it just reduced because you're not bringing in all the past situations. You're just actually being present for what's happening right now. Mm. It's quite revolutionary. And, and sounds simple. Sounds simple. <laughs> the reality to that is a little different. Yes. I mean, when we think about that, how much of our time do we spend in our past or in our future as compared to in the present? So I'd love to just ask you, if we're getting started on this process, and let's just take, you know, a really simple example of um, I was driving in here today and someone pulled out in front of me. And so I can, you know, there's sort of that immediate mm -hmm. swear words, mm -hmm. but where that, you know, like you can kind of almost feel that rush of anger and mm -hmm. that rush of emotion. Yeah. So in that moment, what the heck do I do with that as compared to venting and, and, you know, being annoyed and yelling at them. Yeah. Well, the what you can do, what is the highest form of self-care is to be honest about the emotion you're experiencing without judgment. Mm. So to take away all the thoughts that you have, like, oh, I shouldn't be angry or, you know, whatever, and you can replace it with, this is a legitimate feeling that I have but it may not be helpful. So
So you're soothing yourself right away by, by recognizing the strong emotion that this event is triggering and you're being respectful to yourself because instead of being like, you know, uh, patronizing, say, oh, you shouldn't feel that way, you're saying, no, this is a legitimate something that I'm feeling. This is legitimate. However, it might not be helpful. Mm-hmm. And so to just pause just for that second, and instead of giving yourself judgment for feeling a certain way, feeling jealous or feeling envious or feeling you know, angry or fearful, to just give yourself some acknowledgement and some credit for you know, all, that situation really did trigger some awful things. And, and I'm going to do the self-care and self-love to just sit with myself and acknowledge that that's a legitimate feeling that I have. So in that moment, you can do that. And then what, what I recommend is um, the moment you have a few minutes to rather than, oh, that was a horrible event and I really was upset, and then pushing it aside and ignoring it because it'll come back in your memory. Like, you know, I teach meditation and people have a real difficult time quieting their mind. Mm -hmm. But it's not quieting their mind, their thoughts that they're having a problem with. They're having difficulty um, dissociating the emotion that goes with the thought. So take a few minutes and make it a priority as if you're dealing with a teenager or a tantrum two-year-old and sit with that emotion because that emotion is telling you something really important about yourself. And so sit with it. And as you just sit with it, you don't have to judge it. There's no stories. But as you sit with it, it goes from like a full-on tin flame down to like this tiny little pilot light, and sometimes it'll dissipate. So that now that event is over because you've dealt with the emotion that it triggered. Wow, that's amazing. And once we put that over, mm. then the next time something happens, we're only dealing with that event and not the compounding effects of all of these yes, other things that have exactly. happened. And it is a revolutionary way, and it is simple. And then the thing is, people know that they want to let things go. And, I mean, all of the stuff that I share with people, that I've shared with people over the last few years through the workshops and through different things, these are things that people know, and that's what they say to me. I know this stuff already, Mm -hmm. but they may or may not practice it. So it's a matter of, you know, um, finding some things that are helpful and kind of sticking with it. So one of the things that we've been encouraged to do is let it go. Well, it's hard to let it go when you feel that you've been betrayed or slighted by someone or, you know, uh, undermined or, and so it's, that's why it's, I have found it is, the most important thing is just to sit with that feeling that that event triggered in you and give yourself some acknowledgement and some props for for being willing to have live through that and not be you know awful back to that person to still be you know open-minded and be willing to let it go so like I don't think we give ourselves enough props and credit we're just way too hard on ourselves and there's this underlying feeling of not being worthy which actually kind of um, is underneath people sometimes being stressed is that they, they don't have a healthy boundary because they feel that they need validation. And if you get to the place where you have self-awareness and you've accepted yourself, then you're more likely to say, I know my limits and I can't do this. And when you start to do that, it's amazing. And the other thing that's neat about the process of sitting with your emotions just for a moment is one of our major complaints against other people is they're not present for us. Mm. But we're not present for ourselves. So how can we ask someone else? Like my daughter was saying, well, she was looking for validation from somebody else. And I said, well, Look, validate yourself first, and then people will validate it. So be present for that part of yourself that is unrecognized, and other people will be much more present and respectful of you, and you won't have to fight with them to get that respect. You've already given yourself that respect, and they will just naturally give it to you. It's kind of amazing, isn't it? It's 
amazing. I was having a conversation with a friend yesterday, and she's on somewhat similar journey. And it's just like a whole nother appro- approach to life. And, you know, wonderful synchronicity things just happen. And all of those struggles that you used to have, like you'd wrestle with things. You, you just, I just don't find myself wrestling with things as much as I used to. And it's, it is, it's really revolutionizing. So um, that's why I try to give the message and to share with people and give them tools and techniques to help them on their journey. Well, and as you were talking, one of the things that I was thinking about is, is how we can extend kindness to other people that we don't often extend to ourselves. <laughs> yeah. um, and I love that, you know, what you're talking about is actually pretty darn simple. It's and, very simple. And how, how freeing it it is to just be able to say, you know, I was angry or I was jealous or I, I, I mean, all of those sort of negative emotions, even that we don't necessarily want to ascribe to ourselves if we're, you know, these loving, giving people, but we are all multidimensional. So I, I love that. I love mm-hmm. that idea of like, let's, let's really work on, on giving ourselves the kindness that we, we do much more willingly give other people. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So uh, that leads kind of nicely into, um, you know, another area where we were talking about is, is that idea about um, getting comfortable with yourself. And so how does that actually relate to the job or when things um, when that stress starts to bubble up again? If I'm, if I'm comfortable with myself, how, how does that how does that relate to my work? Well, you, I'm sure the listeners can remember people that they admire that stayed cool under pressure. Mm. And we all aspire to it. And in fact, as I've been, you know, teaching and doing these workshops, one of the things that has come back very clear from people is what they desire the most is to be able to maintain their equilibrium in the face of adversity, in the face of chaos. And it, it does take a little while to perfect it and to practice it. But when you can achieve it, as we were talking about before, it is life altering. And so you bring that with you um, everywhere um, to your family and your family relationships. If you're able to stay, remain, um, you know, sort of centered, not that you don't get upset. It's just that you're not thrown off course by every little event and that people and their drama doesn't affect you in the same way. So that being able to stay centered and so getting comfortable with yourself is self-knowledge and processing some of the stuff that's gone on in your life so that you're present and that you're, that you're, you know, you're really centered and you're calm in situations that are, you know, um, uh, chaotic. And it, it's a useful skill and ability in all situations, in life, in family, in work. And then, and then there's also when you're in the midst of a, a major challenge, that might not be the time and you might not be that successful at remaining calm. Um, but afterwards, you can process it. And you can say, look, you know, what are the things that I really was successful with? And what are the areas that I'd really like to see, um, you know, improvement next time? And maybe, you know, that person said that hurtful thing. I really would have wished that I hadn't responded the same way. And so it's those little gaps in between the, you know, stress situations where we really can process it and to take that time to you understand yourself better. And the more comfortable you are, the less you're swayed by what goes on around you, the less you care um, what other people say. I have a term, the carrot and the stick. So um, if we have a lot of self-awareness and we kind of know who we are, we're less swayed by other people's opinion. And if we're looking for other people to validate us, and that's really what's important to us, then when they take it away, we're we're in despair because we don't have their approval. So if we're seeking their approval, that's the hold that they have over us. And when you're comfortable with yourself and you kind of accept your strengths and weaknesses and you realize, you know, 
oh, you know, I'm really good at this and I'm not so good at that, and you just accept it and you're at peace with it, then it doesn't really matter what other people say about you. So you're not responding to that all the time. Mm. So I, I don't know if that answers your question, but it does in a kind of a roundabout way. So. <clears throat> I'm good with roundabout. <laughs> Are there other, when we think about this in terms of, you know, being in our work, I, I, I really love some of the things that you've talked about in terms of, you know, if we can process those emotions as we have them, if we can sit with those just, you know, uncomfortable situations, that's going to help us sort of stay more in the present and we're not going to carry all of this baggage all the way along. What does that do for our work? What does that do for our productivity? What does that do for our ability to get things done in the run of a day? Well, I was uh, teaching a meditation course at the Spirituality Center, and um, one of the participants, uh, he was kind of a heckler, but he said, he asked me how often I meditate during the day, and I said, well, you know, sometimes two or three times a day. And I'm, I mean, I'm pretty lucky because I'm self-employed, and I'm, you know, do my art, and I'm doing stuff. But I do have the time, but I also make it a priority. And uh, he said, you what? You meditate two or three times a day? He said, you must not get anything done. And I said, actually, quite the contrary, because I find that those practices of processing those mm. intense emotions and becoming more self-aware and being more centered and maintaining your equilibrium allows you to be so much more productive. Like, it's unbelievable. Something that would have taken you three hours, a constant um, feedback that I get from people is that they're exhausted and overworked and they are not, they have no clarity. So a task takes them forever. Whereas when you're, you know, somewhat rested or have done some self-care, then your productivity goes way up. So, I mean, um, stress is causing huge financial implications for companies across Canada and the United States and Canada. Stress-related illnesses and stress leave cost $4.5 billion a year wow. just in Canada. Wow. So it is kind of epidemic. And so anything that you can do to, you know, first acknowledge that you're stressed um, the second part is to find ways to make it a priority to get out of the stress mode. Whatever practice, you know, sitting quietly with yourself, mindfulness, um, meditation, but to get out of that stress mode um, is so important and something that as a society we just don't do well enough. And in the long term, it has major uh, consequences if we don't get out of that fight or flight mode. So, absolutely, that's, that's a shocking number. So for those of us who are, I mean, we, we do hear all the time, and it's probably in many ways, you know, related to, to the fact that we are all sort of feeling stressed and overwhelmed in many ways. There's such a focus on mindfulness and meditation, and, you know, I do a lot of work with improving performance, and it's very much related to high performers all meditate. How, what are some tips or techniques that you would recommend for getting started on this? Because it feels a little daunting to be like, I'm going to go and I'm going to meditate. <laughs> and I've tried to do that, and, you know, your brain just races. <laughs> so can you just kind of walk us through how do we do that if we're just starting? We're baby meditators, baby mindfulness finders. Well, first of all, it is our <clears throat> natural state of being. Uh, there's a lot of information about how little kids are actually in the meditative state. And it's only until they're 12 that they get out of the meditative state. So the smaller they are, the more kind of zoned out they are. Mm. Um, there's also everyone has experienced a form of meditation when they're kind of in the zone, either if they're playing sports or doing something that they love to do or even like washing the dishes or taking walks, or that's a form of meditation. Um, so it's important, first of all, the first step is you cannot meditate when you're cranked up. So 
the first step is to kind of somehow soothe your emotions. Because if you're, you know, completely stressed about something your spouse said or something your coworker said, that's not the state to try to get into meditation. So it is kind of a two-step. The first thing you need to do is kind of calm your amygdala down and be in a state of calmness. So kind of let stuff go. And that is the state kind of being in the zone, which is the doorway to meditation. So I think the reason why people find it difficult to meditate, because there's no special thing that you need to meditate. You literally just sit down quietly with yourself. Um, but if you go into it with a racing mind, you're not, you're going to have a real difficulty quieting it. So one of the recommendations is to meditate. Take it, and it's really 15 minutes. So people say, I don't have the time. It's like everybody can take 15 minutes, like do less searching on Facebook or something, (laughs) but everybody can take 15 minutes. Um, One of the people that, a regular meditator, and they come to the drop-in, she was saying that she just will get started meditating and their husband will call her name or something. I said, maybe you need a light that says like, light when you record, like it goes on, I'm meditating. It's like, so try to find um, a specific time early in the morning is the best for your psyche to, because you're the more, much more relaxed earlier in the morning than you are and the late at night. But it doesn't really matter, but try to figure out um, a 15 or 20 minute block that you can take during the day and try to do it, even if it's two or three times a week, but try to get into some sort of routine. And what's important about that, you're also saying this is another form of self-care because you're saying, I am worth taking 20 minutes and sitting quietly with myself. And then there's lots of um, guided meditations. I um, have a link. There'll be a link to a Yoga Nidra, one that is really lovely, and it kind of gets you in the meditative state. So it's kind of um, not very practical to just sit down and try to shut off your mind. Sometimes you need to practice. Like it took me two years to get to the place where I my mind was quiet without thoughts. And that was from the place of being being in the zone through Reiki and, and, you know, doing painting and stuff and playing sports. I'm kind of used to being in the zone. And even with that, it still took me a couple of years to really find that deep meditation. So be um, patient with yourself. Uh, and when your thoughts are racing, just don't get angry. Just say that's just part of the process and eventually it'll kind of click in. Just one day you'll just start to meditate. So really, it sounds like one of the keys is just to sort of be kind and gentle with ourselves to start. That's a big key. (laughs) Okay, great. Um, So Louise, anything else before we wrap up that you wanted to talk about in terms of, you know, how we get relief from stress in this busy, busy world that we live in? Well, in my workshops, um, I try to give the keys to, you know, being emotionally resilient um, the last workshop is about tools. So then some really, you know, good tools, like one of them is um, looking at time differently. I teach in the, the, the workshops, I um, touch on quantum physics and quantum mechanics in a few ways because it's kind of where spirituality and science meet. And it has some phenomenal principles in it. And one of the things is time. And it, it helps you to shift the way you look at time, which is a huge source of stress for people. So, um, you know, um, we, we accept deadlines to motivate us. And we're a little afraid that if we get rid of our deadlines or that sign of negative motivation, we won't be performers the way that we should be. But there's a lot of that that we can let go and be loving. And then our motivation stems for what do we love to do and what do we enjoy doing and how can we, how can we do this really well. So that's really important, that shift from you know, deadlines and coercion of ourselves. So one of the processes that I ask people to do is shift from um, thinking that they need stress or that they like stress. Because you can't say, well, I'm stressed and I use it. And I, I've talked to some people and they're like, yeah, 
I like stress is useful. And I'm like, well, you can't in the same uh, sentence say, you know, stress is useful and then I'm stressed and this is, um, you know, hurtful to me or dangerous. Right. So, you know, you got to let it all go. Like, you, so part of it is letting the negative motivations go, the motivation to, you know, deadlines and time constraints and and those kinds of things. Some of them are arbitrary, but a lot of them are self-imposed. So that's a really important, you know, piece of the puzzle. So it really my focus is... Um, uh, you know, getting people to touch, be in touch with their emotions, deal with some of their past trauma, and um, and then so they can be a little bit more present, and then be more resilient, and then life is a lot easier. Well, it sounds lovely when you say it like that. <laughs> um, so for folks who are interested in your workshop series, we can um, put a link in the notes yep. that will will um, help them find you so that you can um, certainly help organizations with this idea around how do we get relief from stress. Yep, yep. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for your time and your wisdom, Louise. Oh, you're welcome. It's my pleasure. Mm -hmm.